When you're right, stand up for your actions. When you're wrong, admit it, correct it, and try to move on. Is that what happened tonight in Justin Trudeau's office? What to make of this sudden, at least partial, flip-flop on expenses? Andrew is in Toronto. Chantel's in Charlottetown this week. And Huffington Post Ottawa Bureau Chief Althea Raj is with us this week from Ottawa. All right, Andrew, you start us off. What, uh, what did, you know, I, I assume that it must, something must have happened between 3 o'clock at the end of the question <laughs> period and 6 o'clock when this release came out from Butts and Telford. Uh, uh, something really changed their mind. It, uh, probably a meeting or two. Uh, uh, I mean, they're attempting to try and regain control of the narrative. It was clear that the previous strategy of just stonewalling on this, we didn't even find out the names at first, uh, was not going to make the story go away. And somehow the names did emerge. I'd be fascinated to know exactly what happened there. But it's an odd uh, play because the same people who apparently didn't have enough judgment to know that these expenses that they're now willing to repay were inappropriate at the beginning are now to be the judge of whether they're appropriate or reasonable now. And the only thing that's changed between those two judgments was that it became public. Mm -hmm. So I'm not entirely sure this is going to uh, satisfy the opposition. Chantal? Yeah. Well, nothing will satisfy the opposition, <laughs> and I don't think that's the goal of the exercise. The goal is to get everything, all the nasty stuff out uh, once and for all and hope that the, the news cycle uh, makes the story go away. It's more likely to go away uh, because the breakdown was, put, uh, was made public and because some money will be repaid rather than wait for someone to get the breakdown and say, what is this money for? Uh, what does it cover? Uh, but at the end of the day, if they didn't know that their names would come out when the story started, they're not earning their pay because it was the most expected uh, piece of news, the name of those two officials. Once you knew there were two of them with higher uh, relocation expenses, you basically had a very short list to work from. Althea, you're closest to the action being there in Ottawa. What do you make of this? I think they're trying to protect the Prime Minister. I mean, at the end of the day, it was Mr. Trudeau's choice whether or not to grant these expenses. And the way the guidelines are written, he would have known uh, how much they were before he approved them. Um, and so by taking responsibility for this and suggesting that it's a whole of government error, at the, at the very end of the statement, it says that the prime minister is going to be asking the clerk of the Privy Council to review the rules for everybody else. So essentially bureaucrats who have been enjoying, uh, I don't know if you're supposed to call them perks, but these benefits uh, might see them curbed as a result of uh, Jerry Butts and Katie Telford's actions. Um, in question period today, uh, they're basically the Conservatives devoted all of question period to attacking them um, and attacking the Prime Minister on this, on his judgment, giving his best friends, uh, Butts and Telford, who the Tories described as millionaires, I'm not sure that's accurate, um, uh, you know, a personal benefit, a very expensive benefit, more than most people make in a year. Uh, yeah, except can we agree that uh, this is a fairly standard uh, moving expenses package uh, that is offered by many companies and also by many public administrations. There is nothing in there, paying the real estate agent, the land transfer tax, there is nothing in there that will surprise people at that level who have been transferred to another city. Uh, and to Maybe that not. Point, and Maybe to not. that point, let me, uh, let, I'll get back to you in a second, Althea. Okay. To that point, to Chantel's point, let me just read you part uh, of the statement that Telford and uh, Butts put out uh, this evening. These kinds of breakdowns have never been released before. As leaders of the government's exempt staff, we take responsibility for this policy. We will not be asking the same reimbursements of other exempt staff, nor will we call on members of previous governments to do the same. It's almost like a warning shot there that they, they think they have something that they could uh, add to this debate. Um, and then it concludes, we take full responsibility for this having happened, and because of that, we are sorry. We've learned a lot of lessons over the past few days, and we commit to continuing to improve transparency in the future. Althea, the point you were going to make was? Yeah. Well, if you talk to people who were there at the tail end of the last Harper PMO, they'll tell you that they had capped moving expenses to about $5,000 that they were included in the letter of offer. And so, yes, senior executives were entitled to these benefits, but that the Tories were super focused on anything like this ever coming out in the media, that they had capped that number. And I think that this plays into a narrative that Conservatives are trying to build, whether it's on Jane Philpott's 
so-called limo expenses or those 40 staffers that went down to Washington for the state dinner is that the Liberals are less careful with taxpayers' money. And how this could not have raised any red flags before it became public in Parliament earlier this week, I, I think it's mind-boggling, actually. Yeah, you know, I mean, the, the amount is certainly strikes a lot of people as unusual. Look, there's nothing, there's nothing in principle outrageous about paying moving expenses, but neither is it a principle of natural justice that you get your expenses paid. When you're hiring somebody for any job, you pay a total compensation package. This might be one element of it, or it might, might not, it depends. And it's really going to be a matter of the negotiations between the two parties on the one hand, and in, in the case of the public sector, it's also a question of what looks reasonable and right to the ultimate employers, which is the taxpayers. Well, uh, picking up on Althea's point, which uh, is interesting as well, the liberal story is one thing, the conservative uh, story in terms of what their approach is right now. You know, we, we tend to focus sometimes on the leadership race, and everybody says it's pretty boring, and, you know, where's the action, where's the excitement? Meanwhile, the conservative opposition research group is clearly working overtime on stuff. They are, they are building this narrative in terms of uh, issues that are confronting the government, you know, a relatively new and inexperienced government to some degree, but they are getting themselves, uh, they're having problems. And I think this afternoon's action, one might assume, was to try and stop the bleeding on that front. But the government is also not helping itself by having so little to say on major files. Uh, and for, for instance, this week, sending the prime minister to do a press conference where I am uh, a bit puzzled by the notion that he did well because he managed to say nothing. Uh, if, if you are not con offering something and giving the agenda a shape on the Hill, the opposition will do it for you, and it's happening in this case. Oh, you want to pick up on that? Oh, well, it's a very good point. I mean, he can't or he doesn't seem willing to answer even basic questions, like will there be a, a vote on a future UN peacekeeping mission? He skated over every single question that was posed to him, and it's great that you have this you know, so-called open and transparent government, but if the, he's not giving you any answers, what's the point of having the press conference to begin with? All right, let me show you one answer he did uh, give a couple of times this week, once in New York and then once again this afternoon, or show it from this afternoon. And it's on this question of whether or not uh, they're, they're not whether or not, but that the government's moving forward to try and have an extradition treaty arrangement with the Chinese. Uh, watch this. On the issue of extradition, as uh, I've said a number of times and I've uh, spoken with the Premier about it, uh, we recognize that Canada and China have uh, different systems of, uh, of uh, law and, and order and different approaches, uh, and it'll be very important that any uh, future agreement uh, be based on reflecting uh, the uh, realities, the principles, the values uh, that uh, our uh, citizens hold dear in each of our countries. Uh, that is uh, clearly understood uh, as we move forward on a broad range of issues. All right, and just in, in case you're wondering, the Premier he's talking about is the Chinese Premier who is visiting uh, Canada on this day. Andrew, uh, where, where are you on this, on the, the extradition treaty with China? Well, there's a larger context to this, which is that this is a government that is, I think, has a certain uh, overweening uh, lust to, to have uh, close relations with China. And it is one thing to say, okay, we'd, we'd like to do trade with China. We can't not do trade with China. The chances of us changing their behavior is pretty small. But we can at least not let our desire to trade with China affect our behavior or our desire for other things from China. To be striking an extradition treaty with a country that doesn't just have a different system of law than us, they do not have a system of due process. They do not have a fair system of law. They are one of the world's notorious, most notorious human rights abusers, whether it's systematic torture, whether it's widespread use of the death penalty, whether it's the use of show trials, etc. So to be even talking about extraditing anybody to face that system of justice is really troublesome. When you pair that with the curious timing where this announcement drops without a great deal of fanfare, a day, I forget whether it's a day after or a day before the release of Kevin Jarrett, um, it, it, it's hard not to start see a linkage between those two ideas, or if you're looking further down the road, whether, whether are we trying to curry favor with the Chinese uh, in the eventual vote on the a seat on the Security Council. So it raises a lot of questions, but on its own, on its face, it's very troublesome that we would th be thinking of extraditing prisoners uh, to, to, the, to China. Sean Tao? Uh, and to try to, to downplay it, put it on a government website uh, and not run ahead of the controversy and take control of the narrative, which 
uh, they could have done, but they didn't do. Clearly, they didn't want this issue to have a lot of profile. And if it hadn't been raised uh, in a front page story in the Globe and Mail, the, the visit would have gone without this ever coming up. Uh, also is troublesome in the sense that uh, you can't talk about transparency and then just show off what you really want people to look at and hide the rest in plain sight. Althea, you, uh, you watched the Prime Minister today on this. You, you were in New York earlier in the week uh, where he was talking about it as well. How do you see this? Well, I thought it was pretty concerning that the Premier actually said, well, you know, we can't guarantee that there's no human rights abuses. And we, the media here, we really didn't do our job to ask the Prime Minister, does he believe that the current uh, legal system in China is sufficient? Uh, you know, would he sign an extradition treaty now? We, we did not ask him that follow-up question, and I, it kind of begged for it uh, from the Premier's comments. The UK, Australia, uh, New Zealand... The United States don't have an extradition treaty. Australia actually negotiated one, but they never ratified it because of the concerns that many Canadians have. Um, so I'm hoping that the announcement that uh, Canada was engaging in the security dialogue was just sort of a tit for a tat to make sure that Mr. Garrett could come home and essentially to save his life because uh, he could easily have died there. Um, his health was not well. But the idea that we would pursue this further, I think, is deeply concerning, and the government hasn't made an adequate case for it. And Andrew, you seem to think it's all about cuddling up to the Chinese on other issues, right? Well, as I say, there's the, there's the trade issue, and nobody is, I think, going to make a case that we shouldn't trade with China for the reasons I said. It's, 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 they're there, they're an enormous market, and whether we trade with them or not is not going to have a huge impact on human rights in China. You can kind of argue that one either way. But it's when it starts affecting our behavior and our values and our principles uh, where we're complicit in this case. We would be complicit in sending people to China uh, to face God knows what fate. Uh, that's, uh, that's, I think, where we have to start drawing lines. There's well, the Prime Minister said that he would not send people to China if they were going to face the death penalty. Well, that's kind of reassuring, <laughs> but uh, it, it also begs the question, this is a, a Prime Minister that has made basic rights, uh, something that is, he says mm -hmm. is fundamental to, to the way that he runs the government and the way that he, he sees society. And, and then to come up with an initiative like that and not be able to defend it, because I don't think he managed to articulate it uh, very convincingly, is also troubling because it's, a, it's kind of a double message. And there's a lot of abuses short of the death penalty that China could impose. And I would suspect that our ability to actually monitor and track what happens to people after they're delivered back to China is distinctly limited. When you step back, we've only got a minute left, but when you step back and look at this, uh, the performance of the government in the last couple of weeks, really, um, are they having a shaky time here? Are they, uh, are they on shaky footing here right now? Well, you've got... Uh, it could be that they're putting a lot of energy on those uh, foreign visits, China. They're all important. But the thing is that the prime minister, and that's systematic, makes commitments on the world stage, gets applauses for climate change uh, at the UN, for peacekeeping missions, uh, China, and then comes home and doesn't seem to be able to follow through. It's as if governance and, and accountability to Canadians on those promises is an afterthought. All right, last quick word, Andrew. Uh, the strength and weaknesses of this prime minister and this government are the same. It's the flip side of the same thing. It's either self-confidence, which allows him to make generous gestures at his best, or it's hubris. And when they're having their weak periods, it's when the hubris is taking place of the, of the magnanim magnanimity. All right, leave it out there for this week. Interesting times. Althea, good of you to join us, as always. Uh, Andrew here in Toronto and uh, Charlottetown offering up lots of lobster, I'm sure, to Chantel. Enjoy it. All right. Well, not surprisingly, Rex has some thoughts on all this, too. And here he is. <laughs>